When he was a kid, Billy witnessed his parents' murder at the hands of a man dressed like Santa Claus. Raised in an orphanage, Billy was abused by a sadistic nun and taught that everyone deserves punishment. Now grown up, Billy dons a Santa suit of his own and embarks on a killing spree on Christmas Eve in the controversial, distasteful, and horrifically outrageous 1984 cult classic, Silent Night, Deadly Night. I'm Connor Azagari. And I'm Caleb Leger. And this is Filmgasm. Happy Wednesday, everybody, and welcome to the 2021 Christmas episode of the Filmgasm podcast. This year's selection was chosen by my co-host, Caleb Leger, and it's a perfect Christmas flick for this show. In the past, we've done such holiday classics as Black Christmas, Gremlins, Batman Returns, Krampus, and The Nightmare Before Christmas. It's fitting that we add Silent Night, Deadly Night to our holiday roster. Before we get started, um, stay tuned for a very special announcement at the end of the show something we've been leading up to on Sneak Preview and Filmgasm for quite some time now. Uh, So let's just jump right in here. Um, Why don't you tell us about why you chose Silent Night, Deadly Night, what this film means to you? So I chose this, one, because like a lot of the films you mentioned, we've already covered films like, well, I haven't covered them on the show, but y'all have covered, you know, things like Black Christmas and Krampus. They're like real favorites of mine for the holiday season. But this is one that like I had heard about for years. Like it's just like it circulated on the internet. And, you know, it's a film that like had a huge cult following. <coughs> and I finally, when I went to the gas station from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I picked up the Screen Factory editions there. They had one and two there on Blu-ray, and I picked them both up. Because Joe Bob for his Christmas special that year was showing the sequel. Because And he had a whole like, reason why he didn't do the first film, which I'll worry about that whenever we get to the sequel one day. <laughs> but um, because of it, it just it grew more and more. I mean, like, I need to see this. I've heard everyone say it's like one of the most definitive Christmas horror films out there. Like a lot of horror fans put it up there a Black Christmas when it comes to like a yearly rotation of what to watch for Christmas horror. So I was like, you know what? I want to watch it. I fucking want to finally see this. So I was like, let me throw it on the podcast. And that's actually what I put on this year. So this is my first time finally sitting down watching it. Really? So, yes, this has been one long buildup for me. <laughs> and <laughs> spoiler alert, I fucking loved it. It lived up to my very long-held expectations. And it will definitely be a yearly tradition for me to watch this. I had no idea this was your first time with the movie. I, you've been busting my balls about this thing. <laughs> like, you haven't even seen it yet? <laughs> yeah. God damn it. Well, I I kind of liked it too. I didn't love it, but you know, I'm a I'm a tough sell. <laughs> we've we've established that. Uh I nearly watched this last year. Um I printed out this thing for my family. It was a 24 days of Christmas movies, and it was a list of random Christmas movies, and we would draw a number, and whatever number the movie was, we'd watch that as a family. And we had, you know, I had you know, tr- you know traditional ones. It's a Wonderful Life, uh, Christmas Vacation, Scrooge, Die Hard, all the you know the typical ones. But I also had like The Ref and uh, Harold and Kumar Christmas and Silent Night, Deadly Night. And we drew this, and uh, I we ended up not wanting to rent it for like three, four bucks. We were like, this probably isn't going to be very good, and we decided not to do it. So I ended up not watching this last year. God, I've been so on it. I mean, like, no, we're renting this. I know. I was really, in, I was really into that whole system. The rest of the family was like, "Hey, we just want to watch our classics." And I'm like, Ugh, "All right, fine." So I backed out of the project. <laughs> we made it like three days, and they were like, "We don't want to do this anymore." Uh, wow. I know. I'm gonna try it again in the future. Uh, so this is yeah, this is my first time with this movie too. Uh, let's um, let's get into it. The film was uh, pretty controversial for its depiction of a killer Santa Claus, um, an image which was prominent in the film's marketing. And uh, that and the way it depicted the Catholic Church as being uh, pretty sadistic. Uh, I mean, Catholic Church has done enough to already ruin its reputation. So I don't know why they're coming after this movie. I always think about that um, 
that Bill Burr morning show appearance where they grill them on Catholic church jokes. And they're like, don't you think you went a little far with the Catholic church jokes? And Bill just bounces back with, don't you think the Catholic church went too far? <laughs> Immediately tense as shit in the room. <laughs> Fantastic. But yeah, the, uh, you know, Christian mothers and fathers were like, how dare you show our children this filth and picketed the movie and demanded they pull it uh, from theaters and they fucking won. Uh, this movie was pulled from theaters after just a week. But despite that, it still managed to be a box office success. Well, um, and I'll go on like I have like I know you made notes. I have notes because I was watching the bonus features. They talked about that. Um, when they were doing the marketing for the film, they played it during like football tournaments and stuff, like during the middle of the day. Shit. So, like, <laughs> That's bold. Already, yeah. Like, um, so it already true, like, people were already noticing, like, okay, what is this? And so before it had a chance to even come, really come out, the controversy was starting, like, oh, you're going to make a movie about Killer Santa and blah, blah, blah. And one of the producers said, like, maybe had they released it in October, People would have been a little less like on it, but he's like, I get it. It's a Christmas movie. Like he goes, I get it. He goes, but that it was just like a way to see if maybe that would have stopped controversy a little bit more. But in a way, yeah, you know, they con because of it when it came out, they picketed, they fucking were standing outside theater saying, Don't see this movie, how dare you, blah, blah, blah. And the phone got pulled after a week of, of release. But the thing is, and they pointed out, that only made the film more successful because they said, think about it, you're a teenager. You're not supposed to be watching an R-rated film to begin with, but now you're being told, you know, you can't watch this one because of this. That makes you want to watch it more. You make sad in with the fact that at the, at the time, the home video market was starting to become a thing. And, you you know, you could go and rent movies at the video store now. What better film for teenagers that heard about controversial fucking Christmas horror movie than Silent Night, Deadly Night. So it became a humongous hit on the home video market. And because people were just wanting rent. And to this day, it's advertised as the film they don't want you to see. Like, they haven't stopped utilizing that angle because of the controversy. So, yeah, it was, you could say it was dumb to an extent, but it only furthered helped the film's reputation. Especially in the horror community. That's true. It all comes back to, you know, there is no such thing as bad publicity. The more you call something controversial, the more you tell your kids, you can't see this. Don't you dare see this. They're going to fucking watch it. They're going to want nothing more than to see this movie. Uh, so the worst thing they could have done is draw attention to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, well, well done. <laughs> yeah. And because of it, all, all it's almost come full circle because now for a lot of horror fans, it's a yearly tradition to watch this film. Like <laughs> you have merchandise, me and Josh, um, and this is really a plug if for all the, any fans out there listening. Get on Kickstarter if you're a fan of Fright Rags. A part of Fright Rags was a Silent Night board, uh, Deadly Night board game that the producers are working on. Um, me and I, I put in, I backed, I backed, I did, I did the two game tiers. So me and Josh can each get a board game, but I'm backing it. I'm really excited to get it when they get done with the campaign. But like, there's Murder Space Color. I have a Silent Night Deadly Night coloring book I got from Fright Rags. There's t-shirts like all of it did was cause this film to become one of the biggest things in horror. Like it's a yearly tradition for people. This merchandise out the ass was a fucking board game coming out. Like, do you think that would have happened if the controversy hadn't been as like blown out of proportion? Do you think if they had just left this alone, would this have maybe not have been as huge as it became? I possibly. I think it still would have had a, a good cult following nonetheless. Because the movie itself has a lot of good merits to it and things that make you want to keep watching it again and again. That's true. But I do think the controversy, yes, played a definite, a very <laughs> big part of it, a big search. And I think it still plays to this day for young core fans that are, you know, getting into the genre and figuring out what to watch and they hear about this movie and its legacy. So, yeah, I do think to an extent the controversy has only helped it get bigger and become much more of a horror staple. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, <coughs> Silent Night, Deadly Night was directed by Charles E. Sellier Jr., who only directed two other films, 1984's Snowballing and 1985's The Annihilators. 
He was most known for being the producer and creator of the TV series The Life and Times of Grizzly Adams, which aired for two years in the late 70s. Um, he died in 2011 at 67 years old, and he never really got to have a directing career because this film, uh, the controversy surrounding it, kind of killed the careers of almost everybody involved with it, which is a shame considering how popular it did become. Uh, I was reading about this guy's, um, he was a big time producer in the 70s. He became uh, well known for his method of um, renting out, like he rented theaters and then made them show his movies. So he got like a bigger percentage or something like that. It was, it seemed pretty shady, but uh, as a director, he had, you know, three movies and then he disappeared. Yeah. Like the contrast did have that kind of backlash. Like as much as it helped the movie, a lot of people involved in this didn't get to do a lot. But again, at the same time, it's come full circuit. I mean, the actor who plays Billy, he's on the convention circuit constantly. Fans are constantly have they always have the opportunity to meet him now because of conventions. The producers are currently working on the reboot for next year. So I mean, Linnea Quigley has continued to remain one of horror's biggest, like, you know, screen queens. So there <coughs> eventually people came around, but yeah, it definitely was kind of like I always just, to me it was kind of like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. There was an immediate kind of like don't work with these people type of deal this 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 only seems to happen in horror it's like people there's people out there who can't differentiate between fact and fiction like it's it's so weird like just appearing in a movie like this can completely sabotage any hopes you have of a profitable career and no matter what you did or what the movie did it's just being here and there's some movies that you know some horror movies that have that and some other horror movies which are just you know, career starters. And it's weird where people draw that line. Yeah, it's weird that, like, and it's just weird to me, like, somehow a, a night of someone dressed up as Santa Kelly is just too too far. I'm like, it's rated R. It's meant for adults. It's not that far, people. Like, stop being so fucking sensitive to everything. Just, I, I wish that, I mean, I do. You know, there's certain genres out there. <laughs> that I know just aren't my cup of tea. You know, I typically don't watch rom-coms because I'm like, I don't really care for them. But I don't go out and try to stop rom-coms from being made because I don't want anyone to watch them because they're the devil. Like, just stay out of your, like, stay in your own fucking lane if you can't appreciate other genres. Why do you keep trying to take it away from everybody? Yeah, so, so you don't go and pick it outside the fucking theater no. if people didn't for this movie. Yeah, I'm not out. I'm not like waiting outside the theater of How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days, being like, "Romance is the devil." Like, no, I'm. Not, <laughs> I'm sure there are people like that, but with horror movies, this has never really stopped. I mean, it's not you don't see it a lot these days, but there is still the you know a, a vocal minority of people who are constantly trying to take these down. Yeah, but now there's just on there, and then they can get ignored a lot easier. And what's funny to me. It's its own. This issue only was in America with this movie because other countries have a much creepier, fucking idea of Santa Claus known as Krampus. We got the fucking 2015 movie because of it. Like, and and I'm sure there's other films. Another one I'd recommend is Rare Exports, a foreign film, fucking awesome film, dealing with like evil Santa. But like foreign countries, they do with Krampus. I think that's actually how they say it, not Krampus. I think that's how us Americans say it. Of course. Um, but and that that actual story is horrifying so it's like we're the only ones that because we're american we have to sugarcoat every fucking thing that made it into santa claus and made it much more uh friendly and then god bless this phone comes on says like let's have some fun with it let's make him a killer santa because they even made the comment when they were coming with the movie that you know uh, the writer's like, you know, he wasn't the biggest fan of slashers, but he's like, I knew about slashers at the time because one came out every fucking week. And when they were coming up with the ideal, they were like, we can't, what holiday can we do that hasn't been touched? Because at that time, almost every holiday had been touched. And then they're like, has anyone done Christmas yet? And that's how they kind of came up with it. Like, well, no one's touched Christmas. Let's do it. Let's go for it. Let's have fun with it. I was the biggest thing the Rob point out was like you want to have fun with it. And he goes, what better way to do that than having it be a killer, killer Santa? Yeah, makes sense to me. But then you know, I'm I'm a rational person. Uh, I guess you know, 
I mean, I haven't read the Bible, but unless like Santa Claus is Jesus's brother or something, I'm pretty sure Santa doesn't come up. <laughs> so I don't yeah, really get the religious implications the of this. Yeah. And that's the other thing. Like, guys, adults out there, I don't know if you know this, Santa isn't real. So why are you acting like he can't? Why are we acting so beholden to a fictional thing that you make up to make your kids happy? Like, <laughs> Yeah, you don't see this shit about like you know, movies about the Easter Bunny. It only happens at Christmas. Uh, yeah. it's weird. I'm trying to think Americans actually think Santa is real. Like, I'm trying to think like the lie is becoming the truth for a lot of people. There was a. I remember a few years ago, I was watching The Daily Show back when John Stewart hosted it, and I, I miss him. He was so good. Um, and he, he was running a segment at Christmas. Uh, Megan Kelly, who I fucking despise was um def- was defending white santa there was there was a black santa claus statue somewhere near fox news or something and people like they were going to ape shit over it and she was like santa claus is white he is white like what this is not it it shouldn't even be an issue and like who fucking cares like he's he, does, he doesn't exist why are, why do people give a shit i was like she eventually Tell your kids he doesn't exist, and you have that moment where he goes, "Oh, so Dad's been eating the fucking cookies at night." <laughs> like, like, it. I don't like why. Yeah, why get into that? Who gives a shit? Santa does not exist. So why do you care? When I was a kid, I walked in on my grandpa, uh, taking off the Santa beard, like after pretending to be Santa. I was like five years old. And there was a, I remember there was a pause <laughs> and my dumb ass went, pop up. You just missed Santa. <laughs> I know he just had like a, like a sigh of relief. when you said that. <laughs> I had like, a, oh. I had a really strong imagination as a child. <laughs> he was like, Oh God, thank God. He's an idiot. Like, <laughs> That would have been our response. Thank God my grandson's a fucking moron. Whoo. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure he had that thought. <laughs> Good times. Um. I remember I the illusion kind of broke for me when um I realized when my parents had all the gifts in the house. So when they would like leave me alone, they may go do something. And I would go sneak to find the hidden gifts. And then I noticed that they would pop up in my stocking. And I was like, Wait a fucking minute. <laughs> I think I was a dumb child because I found the hidden gift cache too, but I just assumed Santa was like keeping him there and like wow. like he'd stashed presents in every house in the world and then like all he had to do was travel from house to house and like arrange them. Wow. <laughs> I remember that's how I found out I was getting like Scream 1, 2, 3 on DVD because I had found my mom had hidden the DVDs and I was like, oh. One time my mom tricked me into buying my own Christmas present. I was we were I remember we were at Target and uh I found the first it was a the first season of DuckTales on DVD. And I was like, "Oh, this is so cool. I love this." And she my mom was like, "Well, why don't we get it for your aunt?" And I'm like, "Okay." And <laughs> like I bought the I bought it for my aunt and then forgot about it. And then on Christmas morning I opened that and I'm like, "Wait a minute." You tricked me. <laughs> wow, they really took advantage of your like in- intelligence or lack thereof as a child. Didn't Apparently, they? see, I was a, I was considered a gifted child. I was in all the like <laughs> honors classes, but around Christmas, I guess I just fucking devolved. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I was a fucking idiot at Christmas it's time like as a kid. South, it's like the South Park episode where they devolve because baby gets booze, but instead it's you you getting presents. <laughs> Maybe I just wanted to believe in magic. I don't know. <laughs> oh, good times. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, I've only got two cast members to talk about, really. There's not a lot of uh, a lot of profitable careers that came out of this movie. Um, Robert Brian Wilson plays Billy Chapman, the killer Santa Claus. Uh, he only appeared in bit parts in various TV shows, mainly soap operas after this film. But as you said, he's... Uh, Touring the convention circuit, you know, doing 
you know, making money off uh, his big one. So good for him. Yeah, he's he's in the convention circuit, you know, me and the fans doing that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I I I I I know for a lot of those guys that's like a very profitable thing and a very nice thing because it's a chance a name to talk about, like they have so many fans that come up of various ages. You have the ones that did see this when it came out coming to meet these guys. You have their children that they may have interest maybe to our younger generation and and seeing it. So you know it's you know, yeah, he may not have had like a super successful career per se post this movie but you know at least he's in the circuit he's you know doing things for the fans and that's awesome yeah success is relative you know what some people might consider a you know a career that failed others might just see you know i had one big movie and you know i'm proud of that so it really depends on uh how you view it yeah and he seems like a generally nice guy he was in the he was in the bonus features talking about the movie for the the screen factory release and he had nothing but nice things to say about everyone involved and all the other actors. And he, he seemed like, a gen- like he was generally very proud of this movie and generally very happy about the fan reception and getting to meet them at convention. So he seemed like a very like nice down earth dude. That's good. I hope he gets to cameo in the new one. Be cool if he played like the guy who runs the toy store. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, I mean, considering the new ones being handled by the executive producers of this first movie. Yeah. And I'll actually kind of, I guess I'll go on and say, I'm sure they're doing that because one of the things I found that when they were doing this movie, they got forced out of the movie. Um, Something happened when they were signed on with, I think, TriStar, and they said, you know, you can do this movie, but you're not going to get any money off it. And they're like, well, wait, what if we do this? And they were like, the lawyers went, nope. What if we do this? Nope. And so they went ahead and signed. So like, well, we wanted the movie made. Luckily, there's no bad blood. They 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 made the comment that they're very proud of the film. That they did say like, we are proud of the film. We are very happy with we're happy with the reception. Um, but it sounds like I think they, from the way it sounds, they got it back, and that's why they're keen on wanting to do it. I think they're they got it back. They're wanna they're seeing how people are reacting to it now, and they're like, let's try to get let's try to make a new one then and get something new for the fans. So. I'm sure if that's the case that they've, they've, they've talked to him about at least being like a cameo and I'm, I'm sure he'll do it. And I know it's, it's, it's fucked up. They got forced out of the movie, but I just, <laughs> I keep thinking of like, they're having a meeting with TriStar for the new one and it's the same, produ- the same people. And they're like, remember us assholes, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> it just happens again. <laughs> this time there is bad blood. They're like, fuck. This was our big one. <laughs> oh, probably, probably not. Probably not. Um, and then um, Lillian Siobhan plays Mother Superior, a sadistic nun who runs the orphanage. And I mean, I've seen you know mean nuns in films before, but God damn, did they really? I think exaggerate this one. I, I thought it was great. Um, Siobhan was also in Predator 2, Universal Soldier, The Man Who Wasn't There, and Catch Me If You Can, among other movies. She passed away in 2008 at 82 years old from breast cancer and heart disease at the same time, which can't be fun. Um, and she's just the worst. Uh, my one, like one of my biggest beefs with the movie is that he didn't get to axe her in the fucking face. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I was hoping, like, kill that bitch. Jesus. Yeah, she, you know, to her credit, she is, like, she does it good in this movie. Like, she, you fucking hate her character. And what's funny is that um, the actor for Billy, again, talked highly of her. He said, yeah, when they said cut, she was the nicest lady to all of us. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. That's that's usually the case. One of my favorite uh, like stories of that is on The Wizard of Oz. Uh, Margaret Hamilton, who played uh, the Wicked Witch of the West, was, you know, like iconically scary, terrified generations of children. But when the cameras weren't rolling, she was the sweetest woman. She went on um, Mr. Rogers show as like herself in a witch costume to show kids like, see, I'm just a normal grandma. I'm not scary. Like, that's awesome. Whereas 
Billy Burke, who played Glinda the Good Witch, was a colossal bitch to everybody. <laughs> so sometimes appearances can be deceiving. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. You know, he he spoke highly, so she was like super nice to the kids, and even like would help them out. Be like, hey, maybe try this for like this next scene. Like she was very like helpful and nice to them. Just, she was like, French, and I'm pretty sure she was dubbed over because I saw another uncredited uh, performance as Mother Superior by Judith Roberts. Okay, she may have been. I didn't even know that. I just remember like watching this, watching this, going, "God, this woman is awful." Kim and I was like, "You know what, Billy? I'm not condoning all the random people you're killing, but fucking get this bitch." Well, at first, I'm like, "All right, he's a, he's stopping a rape. Like, all right, maybe he's not going to be a terrible person. Oh, he's going to kill the woman too. Okay, <laughs> he's he's no hero. <laughs> he's- uh, but we'll get we'll get to it. <laughs> yeah, good stuff." Um, so Silent Night, Deadly Night has an IMDb wait, score. Wait, yeah, yeah. Are we going to go forward on this cast list and not mention Linnea Quigley? Feel free. I don't know who she is, you... so go go nuts. <gasps> Return of the Living Dead. I did Night watch of that. the Demons. I didn't watch that. Already Babes and the Slime Bar Rama. I'm gonna you. I'm gonna let you guess whether or not I've watched that. <laughs> You're killing me, Smalls. <laughs> Well, Nay quickly is, as far as I'm concerned, D80 Scream Queen. She was in a shit ton of horror movies. She even had a horror workout video. God damn it. Oh, before Josh kills me, I got to look up the title. A horror workout video. Yes. Yes. Because she's a very fit woman. She's very into fitness. I could tell. (laughs) And she was known for being nude in almost every single film she did. Oh, my God. I'm looking at her IMDb 2014 Bigfoot versus DB Cooper. That's that sounds awesome. Yeah, I'm telling you, she was like, she was in a lot. She was in a lot of stuff. I mean, yeah, I how dare you try to just go past her, you son of a bitch. I figured whatever I'd miss, you'd you'd grab. I was right. Assault of the Party Nerds 2, the heavy petting detective. Not all winners, okay? Fuck off. Who writes these titles? Like, I, I love it. Okay, she was in Elm Street 4, uh, Night of the Demons, Return of the Living Dead. Trash. I remember her. Okay. I got gotcha. you. I remember thinking, yeah. Damn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was she awesome. the one who, like, had the strip tease in the, in the cemetery? The Return of the Living Dead? Yeah. Yes. Okay, there we go. She also in Eye of the Demon, she's famous for like when she gets possessed by the demon, she takes like a lipstick and like jams it into her boob and it goes in there and you like see it in close up get jammed inside of her boob. What do, what do you mean goes in there? Oh, it goes in there. What what does that mean? How does that how does that work? It just does, dude. Okay, I'll take your word for it. You got to watch Night of the Demons. It's a wild movie. The first two are great. Okay. (laughs) All right. Glad we covered her. Uh, Anybody else you want to shout out? No, I just want to make sure that we didn't just gloss past one of the greatest scream queens of all time. You son of a bitch. I I have. I, I got nothing. I don't feel guilty. But I also, I don't know. It is what it is. You should feel guilty. How dare you? All right. We've talked about her before. We did Return of the Living Dead. All right. But we have to make sure that she gets mentioned because she is a notable figure as far as I'm concerned in the cast. Okay. I, I'm, I, I, I agree. Silent Night, Deadly Night has an IMDb score of 5.9. Rotten Tomatoes score of 44%. Uh, it's not exactly critically acclaimed, but you know, most of these films aren't. It grossed 2.5 mil on a $700,000 budget, spawned four sequels and a loose remake. Uh, so pretty good in terms of legacy. Yeah. Like, like I said, it, it was not like we've talked about, it wasn't like exactly like this big critical, like juggernaut, but I think, you know, I, I kind of talked about it on a sneak preview, like, you know, I briefly talked about it 
but you know, yeah, it may not have done hot, but the ultimate test of a film is how long it, it's the test of time. You know, that, yeah. that to me is Long, ultimate like longevity. Yeah, and that I know I kind of briefly mentioned it when I was talking about like Spider-Man and Nightmare Alley and all that stuff. But like, and this is a case right here where like, yeah, you know, it it got pulled a week after its release. It wasn't the hugest hit. Critics fucking hated it. Yet all of that, and now it's a yearly tradition. Horror fans embrace it. It's a cult classic. And I would argue that it's almost getting out of cult classic status. It's just becoming classic here soon. Like it's like getting ridiculous how many more people are just getting into this movie every single year. You know what I mean? Um, and it's it has all this merchandise and all this love now. And yeah, it it the it has longevity, it has legs. People are still going back to this movie. Yeah, definitely. Otherwise, you know, we might not be talking about it today. It's all about legacy. It's the biggest thing a film can have. Um, so let's talk about some of the highlights of this thing. Um, right off the bat, uh, what the fuck is going on with Grandpa? What what I never explain it. They never go back to it. He just like, has is he faking? Moment. Is he faking his catato- catatonia and just like? Like just fucking with his grandson? Is that all he lives for? I I don't know. Even the behind the scenes, they don't explain it. It's just like they just put it in there. And it's I think to me, I what what that scene does is it almost lays down to you, this is the film you're getting. Like that's the point where the film goes, look, this is the film you're getting. Either you're on board or you're not for the next like hour and like a half or how long. It's only like an hour and twenty something minute film. But you know what I mean? Like at this, like, make your choice now. Either you're with us or you're not. Like, <laughs> and that's why I feel like the, this scene does probably the best. Is it kind of gives you a note of like, okay, am I going to get through this film? Or am I going to just say, fuck it, I'm done? And just, <laughs> you know, personally, I was like, okay, it's ridiculous. We got back from me Silent Night, Deadly Night. Bring it on. Yeah, I wasn't turned off. I was just more like, this is weird. And like, did Billy make that up? Because he's already kind of on his on edge about Santa Claus, and I'm wondering if you know the situation, you know the overactive imagination of kids, or he's like, you know, I also love when um they say like Grandpa can't hear us or even knows we're here, and he's like, well, why are we, why did we come? Yeah, <laughs> like Billy's upset. Like, why are we even here? Yeah, why did we do this? <laughs> I like that. And I like after like they come back after grandpa has this moment and they're like, all right, come on, Billy. And they just keep walking and Billy doesn't go with them. Like they're not going to wait for him to come. They're just going to keep like, hope he I, makes love, it. I love in the car when Billy like says, you know, grandpa said Santa Claus is going to get me. And mom is like, I don't see why he would lie. Like, could, could grandpa be faking it? And all of dad's just like, well, maybe like that's not <laughs> like a revelation. They're just like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> oh boy this has so a, such an odd script <laughs> yeah yeah but i love it but again the director when uh i think oh not the director i'm sorry the writer one of the things he said when he was writing it and not not only was his ultimate goal if he would have a phone with the film right he said i wanted to make sure like if there was the line we pushed way past it because we went past it he goes and that's what his that was what he did throughout. Like anything he saw as like the line, he said, No, I'm gonna go past that and go further with it. And it's very evident in the movie. Like any other movie would have said, like, would not have done that whole grand part. And he'd be like, No, that's just weird. All they would have tried to explain it. And this one's like, We're gonna do it and then not explain it, and we're just gonna keep moving forward. I love that a kid who's already like worried that Santa Claus is gonna get him watches his family get brutally murdered by an evil Santa Claus. I mean, what are the fucking odds of that? It's great. And how brutal too. What like the, the killing of the parents is yeah. really like too real. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um did you watch this on TV? Yes. Okay. Did you watch it uncut? Because that was what I watched on my blue. Okay, I'm just making sure I'm on the same page. I forgot to tell you that. No, you did. You told me that. Oh yeah. Okay. That's why I did it. <laughs> oh. I forget. Okay, it's been long days. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, no, it's it's brutal. Like, like from like the moment you see it, because I love how the film shows the gas station segment, so that you know as the audience, 
this is not do not stop for this Santa. Like, don't listen to your like son. I know he sounds crazy to you, but listen to your son right now. Because you just saw the scene where he kills the fucking gas station clerk and then you know robs it. And as soon as you're like, oh no. And then sure enough, you know, he hits the dad in the head with I guess what was a really good shot with that pistol. Um, I don't know many pistols I can just get through fucking windshield like that while you're backing up but <laughs> um and then like almost rapes his mom like for me i'm like oh am i going to watch a ramp scene in this movie but you know she you know she fights back obviously and he ends up slashing her fucking throat i thought he was gonna kill the baby like no. i was waiting i was wondering what that was gonna happen i'm glad that didn't happen i was like well see that was kind of sports me because i've seen part two already so i was like oh, okay i've seen part two so i know the baby's fine because ricky's the main character in part two. oh is he is he garbage day yes he is okay all right we're probably going to be doing that next christmas uh <laughs> that'll probably be our yearly tradition do the silent night deadly night franchise um we'll have fun and then after two it's gonna be like oh boy let's get through these other ones well we'll have another show for that which we will be talking about later yes um, so yeah, uh, Billy witnesses this horrific event, ends up in an orphanage where they are continuously forcing him to participate in Christmas, which he has no interest in because Santa Claus killed his family. It, it's almost comical how like Mother Superior is so determined he participates, even though they have a line of dialogue where she's very aware of what the fuck happened. Like they know the police were obviously like took care of this whole thing. And even the nuns, like, you know what happened? Like, why are you making him go through this? And she's like, he has to celebrate Christmas. And it's like, you know, he watched his family get murdered by, like, a person he thought was Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It's like, if he's not celebrating Christmas, then he's, like, he's impure in the eyes of God or some shit. And she's all, you know, she's like, my methods work. Trust me. And his, her methods are beating the shit out of him and forcing him on Santa's lap. Like th- that's the me- that's her methods, and then his yeah. brother is fine. Like Ricky's just like you know, there. Yeah, Ricky. Ricky's just like, come on, bro. And that that's when he punches the Santa Claus, isn't it? <laughs> I fucking love that. Like this kid, <laughs> decked, he flew off his feet. That kid's got a hell of a, of a right hook. Yeah, I love the same <laughs> when he gets up. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> just watching a child. Like fully lay out a grown man with one punch. It's it's amazing. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah, and oh my god, you have that scene, and then it's quickly followed by him going to his room and hearing a couple having sex and like what they which I was like, Billy, don't do it. Don't don't peek. Not to be a creep. You're like eight, nine, however fucking old you are anyway. I was like, but you're going to be a cockblock, buddy. Don't do it. And sure enough. He would show up, but mother fucking superior. <laughs> I hate religious oppression so much. And I hate people who just go along with it. Like, I, you know, if I, I would have been like, back off, lady. Yeah. <laughs> like, back off. I don't touch me. Know. I'll deck you like I deck Santa. <laughs> if she's walked in, if I was the dude in that room with the lady, I would have at that point established dominance. And made a point to jerk it in front of her. Like, do it, beat me. I'm not going to stop. That's why I bust my nut, lady. Keep going with firm eye contact. Yeah. <laughs> of course, then you risk the, the risk. You run the risk of getting your dick slapped with a belt, and that's that's, that's bad. <laughs> Thank Good you for you. You're a trooper. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting. Really had a day, man. He he decked out the Santa. And then watched a couple have sex, which uh, you know what's funny about that scene? They make it sound like they're mid just into it, and really they're just like kissing and he's rubbing her breast. But the noises make it sound like they're going to pound town. <laughs> Movies never seem to quite understand that aspect of, of life. It's always too, it's always ne- like not enough or too much. Uh, does it, it 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 weirds me? What exactly is the age difference between Billy and Ricky? Because like at the beginning of the movie, they're like a year apart, and then at the end of the movie, Billy's eighteen and he's like seven. I think that had to do with like 
just not the great casting because in the, I mean the opening it seemed like you know obviously Ricky was a baby and I would I would say Billy was supposed to probably be like five or six maybe um but then like you know they look almost the same age in the orphanage and then Billy is like a full grown man and Ricky looks like he is still like stayed the same age so i think that just has more to do with the like the quirkiness of the film if anything else <laughs> yeah i'll take it uh so billy you know mother superior tells billy like punishment you know is, everyone deserves punishment everyone is naughty so take your medicine which is not a good thing to tell a traumatized kid <laughs> no it is a good thing for us horror fans because it leads to two of the most classic lines from the film which is punish and naughty that Billy just says to people. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little lazy, but I'll, you know what? I'll take it. Um, we fast forward then to Billy, who's like an 18 year old Hercules looking motherfucker getting a job at a to- uh, in the stock room of a toy store. And then we get he that is. like, hmm? yeah, well, so he's a handsome man. I'll say it. Yeah. I was he not is. expecting that kind of glow up with that kind of childhood. <laughs> No, but you know what? I get it, ladies. I understand. I the montage made me laugh. The, the, like oh, the eighties song. I started dying so hard. This might be my favorite montage because it's so unneeded. <laughs> it's, it's just them working at the toy store during I think Christmas Eve during the you know the day of Christmas Eve doing regular work but we get a we get a full-on montage with an 80s song and it kicks ass in my opinion i we didn't need it but we got it and i'm 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 glad i'm looking up the name of this it was like the warm side of the door or something like that uh me all right almost there the warm side of the door yep by morgan ames Warm side of the door. <laughs> it's, it's like a robot chicken sketch. It's it's totally different from the rest of the movie. Yeah, uh, it just and it comes out of nowhere. It's just no like, all right. It's just like all of a sudden happens. I'm like, I remember I was like watching it. And I was like, am I in a montage? Am I getting a montage in my fucking eighty slasher? Did I wander into an episode of Full House? What happened here? <laughs> it's, and I was like, you know what? I kind of like it. I was like, you don't get this in any slashers. What's a, imagine if like halfway through Friday the 13th part, like six, Jason's just like suddenly starts helping them like paint a fence. <laughs> There's a whole montage song. Yeah. <laughs> I would watch that. Start playing Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, what surprised me was... Uh, all of the licensed uh, toys in the store. I, I, there were Smurfs toys. There were Star Wars toys. Like, how did they pull that off? I actually don't know. They didn't talk about that in the bonus feature, so I couldn't find anything on how they pulled that off. Um, the most I got was that when they were actually filming the film, it was like February, so the snow was melting. So all that snow you saw in the front of the store for these other shots, they had people on the roof throwing plastic snowflakes down so it would like be snowing Mm -hmm. um that's about the most i got with the iris toy store stuff i i don't um they didn't mention anything about like how they put off the licensing to get all those different toys maybe the rules are different in the 80s maybe you know they just put them in there and nobody cared enough to sue uh andy what a prick Oh my god! He like for no reason. He like Billy initially is, comes off of his generally like nice dude. Like you're like you know what from the shit you went through, you seemed pretty well adjusted, seemed nice, okay. And just for no reason, it's just a fucking dick to him. I think it's because he feels his masculinity thread. He sees this like Greek god of a man. He's just like <laughs> he's yeah. like I need to establish dominance now. Well, he looks like the fucking you know. Phil from Hercules, the Disney movie. So he's definitely got to establish some kind of like alpha male shit. You know, hey, you're not doing a good job here. Like he was just so over the top. (laughs) And even Billy's like, fuck off, man. (laughs) That was great. (laughs) 
Oh, I love when he's like, you know, si- you know, Sims is not your friend. Like, I'm, I'm nicer than he is. And then he walks in like, hey, Billy, how you doing? Like, just totally fine. Like, I need you to be Santa. <laughs> yeah. And he, I lo- to, to, to his credit, like, uh, Robert, right, Robert, Brian Wilson, Brian, Robert, yeah. I, want, I, I keep wanting to do Brian, Robert. I'm like, no, it's Robert, Brian. It was really, really good in this movie. And when, like, Mr. Sims comes in, I was like, hey, I need you to be the Santa. You can see in his face, he's like, no, no, yeah, Ugh. freaky. And Sister Margaret, I feel like, doesn't do enough to protect him. I mean, maybe find him a job that's not a fucking toy store at Christmas time to the guy yeah. who is super <laughs> traumatized by Santa Claus. I love where she calls and fucking uh, douchebag answers the phone. Oh, Bill, no, he's not back here anymore. He. He's, play, he's playing Santa now. And you can see her be like, he's what? <laughs> and she's being oh. like, we need to go there. Things are already out of control. Like, she's on it. She's just like, things are out of control. I need to get there right now. And I, I when he was Santa, sorry, but when he was Santa, I loved when he was trying to calm the kid down. Oh my like, God. Stop it. Be quiet. Stop. <laughs> Like, how does, like, they're not that far away. Like, you can't hear this clearly agitated guy verbally abusing this kid. <laughs> like, just stop it. Why are you doing this? Stop it. Stop doing that. Why are you doing this to me? Stop it. Like, clearly, he's about to murder. Yeah. I think he says, he goes, Santa doesn't like it when kids are being naughty. And I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, and all the parents are just like standing there and I'm like, no one's hearing this right now. I don't give toys to naughty children. I punish them. And the kid, like, is horrified. <laughs> I mean, I, I felt so bad for that little girl. She runs for her mom. Mom doesn't give a fuck. She's <laughs> like, looks like you had a fun day with Santa. Oh, She's man. Too transfixed. I think that's the thing. Everyone was just like, oh, my God, Santa, hello. I feel like that's what went through the mom's head. I think they were just blinded by the man in front of them. So this is where I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus came from. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. You know, the porno version is like him killing and fucking. He's slaying in more ways than one. I don't know if I can watch that kind of. Por- I don't want to see Santa Claus fucking. I just I don't want to see that in any I'm way, curious. shape or form. I'm curious. I'm not that curious. <laughs> Uh, I loved when the store closes and Sims is like seven o'clock time to get shit faced. <laughs> I wish more people signed off like that. <laughs> he was so happy and he just pulls the shit out. I'm like, you have that hidden in the store <laughs> behind the fucking register. He's just got like so much booze. I mean, this is, they looked like they were having fun, but that also looked like a really shitty Christmas party. <laughs> It did. It looked like no one wanted to join him because this is the fucking boss. Like, yeah. <laughs> and then Andy and uh, what Pamela? I think it was. I think it was, yeah. And the name I, I think Pamela. I want to say Pamela. They go in the back, and he basically tries to rape her. Uh, and Billy, who overhears this, walks in and has a moment of complete, like meltdown where he remembers everything and it all comes back and he goes straight to you know punish and kills andy with christmas lights yeah which again was another thing they point out in the uh, behind the scenes thing was um they made a point to try to implement as many um christmas items for kills as they could throughout like the movie because they were like well that was like, like again adding to that sense of fun it's a Christmas horror movie, like why not have fun with it and use cr- traditional Christmas items as death weapons? That's why. And I even point out like the fact that yeah, he uses the fucking lights to strangle him and kill him. Surprised no one got like suffocated with wrapping paper or something like that. that. Made me too silly. <laughs> <laughs> well, why if he got strangled? Why was he like bleeding when he the, when the body fell? It could have been made, like, depending on the lights, it could have been, like, the light bulb cutting into his oh, skin. That's true. That's true. You gotta remember, they're, all, they're all light bulbs on those things, so, it's like, depending on how, like, what it's made out of and it's shattered, it could, like, cut up your neck. 
Yeah, I, I know how Christmas lights work. I mean, apparently you don't because you're wondering why he was bleeding. I just assumed he got strangled. I never I never saw a, a slice, and you'd think this movie wouldn't like waste an opportunity to show us a slice. Yeah, but I mean, it also had all that controversy, so. But I was watching the unrated cut. So was I. So Pamela, not exactly uh, pleased, is pretty freaked that this hulking Santa dude just murdered uh, a coworker, <laughs> and it's like you are fucking crazy. Get away from me! And he's like naughty, and <laughs> kills her too. Slices I, open her gut. I love how he yells out, "Punish, naughty!" <laughs> it gets the point across. That's for sure. And uh, yeah, he he cuts her open with a box cutter. I think it was. Yeah, he used the box cutter on her. And then that, because he, I think he gets the act afterwards. Mm-hmm. Fucks up his other coworker. Sims gets a hammer to the head. I think it was. Which I was, I like that one. Like, especially when they did the zoom in, you can see it sticking out of his fucking hand. I'm like, oh. Sims was cool though. Like he was, he was a fine boss. He gave him a job. Was you know, gave him good feedback. I think he didn't deserve that. <sighs> no. Um. I, th- I think my fit, and actually, this was a really like big fun sequence for me. It was like the whole toy store slaughter as he's just killing everyone. Um, but my personal favorite death was uh, the last one when she's trying to get out and he like fucking shoots the bow and arrow at her. And I'm just like, holy shit. <laughs> like, first off, who was this in a toy store? Where did you fucking find this item, Billy? <laughs> I was going to bring that up. Yeah. What toy store sells real arrows? <laughs> I was like, fuck me, man. God, <laughs> 80s was a lawless land. It was. The more 80s movies I watched, the more I'm like, what was this world just built on cocaine and bad decisions? <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> it's amazing anybody got out alive. Um, yeah, and then from there, he just starts wandering through the neighborhood, fucking people up. He goes to uh, this one house where uh, Denise and I think Tommy... I don't remember his name, but Denise, is, this is where Linnea Quigley pops in. This is her yeah. character. They're uh, pre-bone on a pool table. And a uh, little girl comes down like, hey, it's Christmas. And she's like, go back upstairs. <laughs> and she's like, but Santa. She's like, fuck Santa. Go to sleep. I mean, fuck I'm paraphrasing. But... Yeah, fuck Santa. I'm trying to get fucked. If you come down here. <laughs> I love when she's like, if you don't go to bed, Santa's not going to come. And the guy's like, that makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> Every 80s horror movie is like one scene away from straight up porn. It's, yeah, it's the beauty of 80s horror. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so the little girl's like, all right, and goes to sleep. And then weirdly, Denise is like, I got to go let the cat in. <laughs> and the guy's like, what? <laughs> Yeah, I was like, usually, like, the dudes are pretty, like, douchey about why they have to stop, right? In this case, I'm kind of with the guy. I'm like, oh, my God. I'd be so annoyed to be like, look, get your goddamn sister to bed (laughs) so she can sleep so Santa can get here. And why is your cat outside? Why did you just not let the goddamn cat in before we even started? (laughs) Jesus Christ, woman. (laughs) If she, Um, like, without, like, a Billy Santa killer around, and had she come back down? I was gonna be like, before I even try this again, is there anything else that you need to fucking do? Well, see, then you're just gonna be pushy and it's not gonna happen. At that point, I'm fine with them. Like, you know what? Screw it. I'm go jerk it at home. I thought it was weird that she put on her pants but didn't put a shirt on. So she uh they asked Larry Quigley about that on one of the one of those features. And she asked them, she was like, out of curiosity, why am I topless? Because no woman would just not throw a shirt back on. And they were like, well, it's, they tried saying like, well, it's because for your death scene, it's easier to get it done without the, the clothes, like, because it's a whole impelment thing. Um, and she's like, they could have been saying the truth, but I'm still not sure. <laughs> that explains why Billy just randomly rips the boyfriend's shirt off in the middle of the fight. Because <laughs> they needed to do the impalement of the glass. There we go. Okay. I was like, why is he 
Why'd you take off the guy's clothes? <laughs> Give me that shirt. Come on. We gotta, we gotta make it look good. It also made me laugh when the caroler, the caroler showed up and the guy's like, I can't work like this. <laughs> he puts on some like, you know, jazzy something. Like he got cock blocked by carolers. I don't think I've seen that before. <laughs> Just he's like, I can't perform. I need something better. <laughs> oh, yeah. Was, and then I was getting cock blocked like every step of the way. This dude is not his night. It's not his night. Carolers, the cat, little sister, serial yeah. killer, bad night. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, so Billy fucks them up. He impales Denise on antlers. There's, you know, reindeer. Yeah. Yeah. Which is one of the more, I think, actually the most iconic death scene from the film. Like, this is the death scene everyone remembers from the film. Makes sense. It's pretty weird. And then Tommy just gets flung out the out the window and impaled on a big ass piece of glass. Yeah, that thing. He got a huge chunk like right into his fucking stomach. I was like, oh my god! It's like, what is this glass made of? Fuck. Me. And the little girl. Yeah, I love the little girls like Santa as he's dragging a fucking axe down the hallway. <laughs> this <And> kid. <laughs> his his present, and I loved it. I was. I was laughing. It was like the dark humor just per- working perfectly. He hands her the fucking box cutter he used to murder. It's all bloody as her gift. And the kid, even the kid, looks a little concerned about it. He's, he's like, um, and there's a look in her eyes of like something's wrong here. <laughs> this isn't a pony. What's going on? Yeah, don't walk into the living room, kid. I think. All right, so. The darkest moment of this movie for me is easily when the cop shoots the wrong fucking Santa in front of the kids. <laughs> the priest. <laughs> that one kid got like blood shot all over his hat. <laughs> well, it's funny because that was dark, but then before that, they have the more comical take on it with that other Santa. When they see the dad who's yeah. dressed as Santa for his kid, they're like, we got him. And they go to the house. And he busts in there, and they and he takes it off, and they're like, "Oh, you're not Billy." I love the kids so defeated, like, "Daddy!" Like, right there, Santa does not exist, and the kid yeah. found out the hard way. The kids defeated. You see the pissed off look on the dad's face, like, "Are you fucking kidding me right now?" He doesn't even care that he's got guns on him. He's like, "You just ruined a beautiful moment with me and my daughter." <laughs> <laughs> she will never. Forgive me for this. <laughs> also, it's super creepy to come in through the window. I mean, I get that you're trying to have a whole thing here, but that would scare the fucking shit out of me as a kid if anybody climbed through my window on the second floor. Yeah. <laughs> if anything, this was clearly a playing thing with the parents. Just have mom bring them into the fucking bedroom. Or just, you know, I don't know loudly go ho 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 in the middle of the night and just have the kid walk into the living room like yeah, anything other than like let me fucking go through your window and i mean he got lucky that didn't traumatize the kid the cops really ruined everything in that case but it could have gone south yeah uh, <laughs> but then father o'brien i think it was gets gunned down in front of a bunch of orphans <laughs> i mean christ <laughs> yeah like there was no hesitation he just started shooting and then i love how the then i was like kids get inside come on and they get so pissed off at the cop they're just like why did you do that but he has the balls to say like i'm here to help i'm not gonna hurt anybody after he just shot the priest to death outside <laughs> and she's like all you've done so far is kill somebody like, go outside. Get out of here. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I love how he's like, well, can I come in? They're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just and, stay out there and we'll keep the kids safe. And he gets an axe to the chest, shining style, and hurled down a flight of stairs in what looks like a basement. What's really funny about this scene, when I was watching the bonus features, the, and this is why I love like the writer actually the writer for the movie actually really hated this scene. He was like, it's getting he's like, you're on the home stretch, and for some reason they want to do this 15 minute segment 
of you know him going through the underground and getting killed and it's like this long drawn out sequence when you're in the home stretch things supposed to be moving but it's funny because he's talking about that but the second year director who was also the editor for the film shot that scene and was talking about like how much he loved it he's like yeah it was really good scene and we got real lucky and found that space where he would like figure out what we want to do with the cop and billy just came out right he's like it was awesome i love doing it and just hearing like the two different if you were one to be like, I love to know and be like, I really fucking hate this scene because it just drags in the home stretch. And I'm like, well, I liked it. It probably wasn't in his script. And, you know, as a screenwriter, you know, if they add anything in, you're probably going to be a little bit biased <laughs> towards your own material. I get that. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's necessary, but I do think it's interesting that there were consequences to shooting a priest in front of children. <laughs> there probably should be comeuppance for that one. You're really, really holding in on that. It's just so over the top dark. <laughs> Not just anybody, a priest dressed as Santa Claus in front of children. Not just orphans in front of orphans. <laughs> I mean, Christ. <laughs> it's so outrageous. Like, I can't, you know, you look at that and you're like, yeah, I, I get why people were, were picketing this one. If you're a Catholic and you see that. Christ, I mean, <laughs> oh boy. Uh, so did Billy shows up. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was like, did you laugh when after that Billy fucking axes the snowman? Yeah, I was like, why why do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> that was overkill. <laughs> that was the real victim, not the cop, the snowman. <laughs> And I love that he just comes up to the window and is like waving at his brother. And Ricky's just like, brother, and just gets up and lets him in. Mother Billy, Superior's like, no. It would elevate much like with the whole, like, come on, Billy. And they just keep going. Mother Superior's like, Ricky, sit down. And then that's it. I'm like, there's a killer. A cop shot a man in front of these kids. And there's a killer Santa. And you're not even going to try a little bit harder to keep the kid away from the door. Well, and these kids get to see Santa Claus die again. <laughs> Another cop shoots Billy in the back. <laughs> like these kids, they just created an entire like legion of future serial killers. <laughs> yeah. Well, technically, at least in this case, the kids do see most spirit almost like. And I will say this. And again, this is something that people were too busy picketing to notice, but the nuance in this scene. As much as like we fucking hated most Spirit throughout the movie, if you notice the moment he gets through that door and gets to the kids, she immediately holds her hands hands out and gets the kids behind her and accepts her fate. As long as the kids are safe, she's willing to do it. So it's like, yeah, she's harsh. She can be kind of a bitch, for lack of a better word. But there's a there's a goodness in there to protect these children. And that it's a little nuance moment that I quickly noticed in the scene. I'm like, it doesn't change how much I hate this character, but I appreciate seeing that. That like there was a moment of selflessness of like, no, take me, I get it, but do not harm these fucking kids. Only I get to brutally assault these children and slap them randomly and force them to do traumatic shit. Only I get to do that. <laughs> Don't you take it from me. That's the vibe I got. And I think she was still, you know, I think she was still holding it over. I'm like, come on, Billy, you pussy, try it. Like, what do you, what do you got? Like, there was a, I didn't get selflessness. I got like, you know, up, upstage right there. Anyway. Wow. You just really hate most career. I do. I don't care for nuns in general. Um, which is, I'm not going to explain that either. Um, <laughs> All right. Bill. Yeah. Billy tries to kill Mother Superior with an ax. Cop shoots raised. It's up. It's up there. Oh yeah. And the cop shoots Billy in the back. And Billy's like, avenge me. And Ricky's like, naughty. <laughs> and you're like, oh, part two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I love how they do that. He just turns the camera. Naughty. And, I'm, and then they end up, I'm like, oh shit. Okay. And Sister Margaret's like, why did I get him a job in the toy store? Why? <laughs> 
it's not, you know, it's not like every other place in America is still hiring at Christmas time. It had to be a toy store. Especially in the 80s. I think we were good on jobs back then. So, yeah, the Reagan era where we forgave a lot of shit because the economy was OK for a while. I don't know if yeah. that's accurate. I think he fucked up know. the economy, actually. <laughs> I'll ask Josh. Yeah, he was there, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't wait for him to listen to this episode. It just him be like, "Fuck you, Caleb." <laughs> I don't really. Well, can can you? I feel like no. I can. <laughs> Here are some film guys and facts for Silent Night, Deadly Night. Number one. The release of this film was picketed by angry parents who were not happy to see Santa Claus depicted as an axe murderer, despite the fact that Tales from the Crypt had done the exact same thing 12 years earlier, and the movie Christmas Evil had done the same thing in 1980. So this wasn't new. Killer Santa was not a novel idea, um, but I guess they chose this one to pick it. As a result, box office sales plummeted once the film was pulled from theaters after barely two weeks, and the film was shelved for another year where it saw new light in an uncut video form, which has since gone out of print. So video, you know, video stores saved a lot of these movies. Um, a lot of their uh, a lot of these films only exist on video now until somebody, you know, some film preservation people find them and then restore them, and then we get like the cool Blu-ray release of random horror movies it's pretty cool yeah no it, it's you know and thank god and that's why i'm you know i you know this is like i get a little bit of a tangent but when people are always like be like how why do you buy physical media you know it's streaming 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 i'm like because if we don't support it now if we don't support companies like vinegar syndrome screen factory arrow video um blue underground uh synapse all these other companies and those like million i'm not grindhouse releasing right that are taking the time to take these films that a lot of people for the general public doesn't give a shit about, but the horror fans do. And there is a niche market that does care and wants it. And they put out these kick ass. They take the time to give us a good transfer and make it look good. They take the time to hunt these people down and give us bonus features that really dive deep into it. And in some cases they even take time to do a lot of fit, cool physical products with it um, and do all the school packaging. And they, put it out there in like the best possible way they can for fans to get. And it, cause I think the worst thing that can happen with film. And as we've seen with the silent era film, yeah. is films that just disappear. Um, and streamers, they don't give a shit. They want to put stuff on them. That's going to get watched. So if, you know, no one's fucking watching, um, fuck it. Like, it, you know, I haven't seen the Joe Bob episode yet, but if no one's watching Gator bait, they're not going to fucking put it on there. But one of these companies will take the time to make a great transfer of it. Or, and put, like I was showing you what I got recently from Vinegar Syndrome, it came in the T-Rex. Like Only they would take the time to do what they did with that fucking movie and get it out there the way they don't fucking 4K, for Christ's sakes. Um, so, yeah, thank God for, you know, physical media and the home video market because this film could have easily just been buried and just gone and not seen, but because of that controversy, because of the home video market, it has had that life, it's had that longevity, and continued to be what it is now. So, yeah. you know, yeah, I, yeah, I'm all for physical media and the fact that I, like I, I told you, I have the screen factory of this and part two in my collection. Well, I've always, you know, I, if you listen to this show specifically, you know that I, I don't always, you know, like a lot of these movies. But I always, I do, I, I like that I get to watch them. I like that you guys bring them to my attention. Like, especially, you know, recently um, on Halloween, you know, Josh introduced me to Trick or Treat. And then a couple weeks ago was Extra. Like films I never fucking heard of. Films that are all but like gone now. But these companies are bringing them back and giving them a chance, you know, a, a new life. And that's great. You know, every film deserves to be seen. And I, I always support that. Regardless of my thoughts toward the film itself, you know, it I'm glad there's people out there who appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 nice. And like, yeah, thank you know, thank God. And it really starts with the 80s on video market. Thank God that happened. Yeah. And that they were able to finally get movies and realize movies can live on. Movies can now be taken home and people can watch these things over and over and over. 
So thank fucking God for that. Because because of that is, you know, you can trace that always what we have now. And the fact that, you know, yeah, people are all like, oh, streaming this, streaming that. The fact that they're still putting out Blu-rays and 4Ks of major release movies, the fact that these niche sites are still going strong shows that there is still a very hungry audience for the physical collection and wanting to own these things and keep it preserved for years to come. You know, back in the day when the home video market first started, um, do you know who was super against it? Spielberg. Oh, really? Yep. E.T. was one of the first tapes, and it was like $600 to buy a VHS of E.T. Is back when VC, like VHS first started, it was a very niche market. People were like, you can just buy a movie and have it at your house? What is, what is this sorcery? What is this crazy shit? And Spielberg was like, no one's going to go to the movies if they can just buy it at home. <laughs> and yeah, so he's always been on the wrong side of film history, which is weird. It, you know, it's really weird, man. Like, as much as I love Spielberg movies, it seems like the more I learn about the guy and the more I kind of like, especially with like in his like recent turn of films, I'm like, you know, Spielberg, I like your movies, but I'm starting to get the idea that you are a pretty pretentious son of a bitch that thinks way too highly of yourself. I mean, all right, true. But if you were the guy who made the Indiana Jones movies and Jaws and E.T. and Saving Private Ryan and like, wouldn't, wouldn't you also kind of think you're king of the fucking world? No, because at the end of the day, you stole shit, fucking die like everyone else. Okay, fair enough. But I, I'm just saying I, I get where it comes from. I don't agree with it, but I get it. I mean, I don't know. I guess it's just like my character. I couldn't be like that. I, I can't stand that. For me, it's like you, sh- you have no right. To- I don't care if you fucking discover a new plant. I don't give a shit. Like, you don't need to be a douchebag. I agree. I think everyone should be humble. But there's some people who are just not going to be humble. And you can either run with it or ignore them. And they're not going to let you fucking ignore them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, like I said, I still like a lot of Spielberg's films. I, I do. It's just, I'm saying, like, between, like, you know, the fact that he could easily fucking, you know, confirm what we all know, and that's Toby Huber directed fucking Poltergeist, but he won't for whatever fucking reason. The fact that he's doing an autobiography film on himself yeah. and that he was so against, like, the idea of, like, Netflix films being served for Oscars when it's, like, Streaming has its place too, buddy. Um, and then now this, that he was so against, like, the whole, like, it's just, like, I don't understand this. I, and it's a lot, it's, it's a lot of directors really kind of, like, in his league and his age that, my, I would say minus someone like Tarantino, I think it's one of the few that don't fucking think like the rest of these guys. Or it's just, like, they're so against anything that isn't fucking cinema. It's just, it's, like, it's so weird to me. Well, the guys who came up in the 70s pretty much think like that. But the guys who came up in the 90s are like the exact opposite of that, like Tarantino and Paul Thomas Anderson. We talked about that on Sneak Preview yesterday, or not yesterday, like a few days ago. Uh, Check that out, by the way, our three-hour episode on (laughs) Spider-Man. That was hurting at work today, but yeah, I am very, I am very proud of that. I didn't think we'd ever be able to pull that off. And like I was saying before we started recording that, like we, we got to do a three hour episode. It's just see if we can do it. And we fucking did it by accident. Anyway, um, number two, film guys and facts. This pissed me off to protest the film. Uh, critic Gene Siskel read out loud the names of the companies that own distributor TriStar Pictures on his and Roger Ebert's TV show then said, shame on you. He also called out the writer, director, and producer and said, you people have nothing to be proud of. (sighs) I fucking hate Cisco and Ebert so goddamn much. I I like Ebert. I have a... Ebert's... He he pushed me to do a lot of (laughs) of what this became. I mean, essentially, this is the Cisco and Ebert format. Yeah, but I feel like we're more forgiving on like because they fucking hated genre so much. They did. 
But their their negative reviews of stuff was funny as hell though. Like when Ebert hated a movie, he he got creative. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. In this case was Cisco. Like, dude, that's petty. Like, you don't need to read off the name of the companies and say shame on you because they made a fucking horror movie that yeah. you're offended by. And then, like, that's ridiculous, man. Stop being a fucking baby. Yep, I concur. And number three, I thought you'd like this. The website Mr. Skin posted the top 10 horror series with the most female nude scenes on October 2020. Uh, the list includes the Witchcraft franchise with 77. And we were talking before we started recording. Uh, neither of us had heard of the Witchcraft franchise. And I looked it up. There have been 15 of these fuckers since 1989. The most recent one came out in 2016. Yeah, you know, uh Josh, I, I'll try to remember to ask Josh Jamal. Um, but if you listen to this, I forget he listens first. Please fucking tell me what Richcraft is. I, Almost I, all of them have been direct to video. <laughs> okay, I could explain a lot of why I don't know. Uh, then there's Friday the 13th with 49. Then Hellraiser with 24. Uh, Wrong Turn with 17. Piranha with 16. <laughs> What I hate that wrong turn isn't that because most of it involves incest, but move on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Piranha with 16, Hostel with 14, uh, Silent Night. Uh, well, wait. No, yep. It's kind of new to you. Like, so it's the first half of the film in Hostel. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. It's like Girls Gone Wild turned into a fucking nightmare. <laughs> yeah. At first, I was like, well, it's not the new to you. I was like, wait, no, wait. You guys are talking about the first half of Hostel when it is fun to see the boobs. Then there's Silent Night, Deadly Night with 14. Then Halloween with 14. Then Amityville with nine. Elm Street didn't make the cut. That's because I know the Elm Street, actually, they don't show a lot of tits throughout the franchise. That's true. I guess they, I just assume they do because all the rest of them do. I was like, no, if you actually assume that they don't, I think the most significant was the nurse in Nightmare on Elm Street 3 that when uh, they got, when Freddy tricked the one kid into the room, that's this hot nurse and she like takes her bra off and Oh boy, that scene is like constantly in my head. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember. Oh, God damn you! God. Apart from the first one and New Nightmare, I don't remember any of the Elm Street movies. You disappoint me so much on a regular basis. I know. <laughs> That's why we have this podcast so I can watch <laughs> these individually and talk about them enough for me to remember them. <laughs> uh, speaking of sequels. The first sequel, 1987, Silent Night, Deadly Night, Part 2. Billy's younger brother, Ricky, takes up the mantle and becomes Killer Santa Claus next, and this has become somewhat iconic for its famous Garbage Day sequence, <laughs> which has kind of become a meme, and is just so ridiculous. Let me tell you something. Watching that scene in all its glory is magical. It's, it's so ridiculous. It's, he is literally in the scene just walking along the street, shooting random people in the neighborhood like that's all that's all it is and it's just like what the fuck is going on <laughs> i yeah i'm gonna have to watch this uh next 1989's silent night deadly night three better watch out a young bill mosley stars as ricky who wakes up from a coma and stalks a blind woman he's psychically connected to uh how's this one I haven't seen past part two, but the general consensus amongst fans is that the first two are cool classics. People watch them all the time. Three through five, most people don't watch them. I heard a lot of, I know uh, when they went up on Shudder um, and they put the whole thing on TV, I was seeing a lot of my Facebook groups, people watching it, being like, oh, they put up three through five on Shudder and Tubi, let's watch it. And I know a lot of people were like talking about like how much they fucking hated three because it just like moves, I guess, at like a snail's pace. Mm. Yeah, I know. We we all kind of agree that the, the cardinal sin a movie can commit is to be boring. Uh, so that sucks. Yeah, I think they said the only thing that's worth taking from the movie is like you see Bill Mosley's brain throughout it. He has like this weird like thing on his head that exposes his brain. So you just see his fucking brain <laughs> throughout the movie. That can't be healthy. Uh, next, 1990s Silent Night, Deadly Night 4, Initiation. 
A reporter investigating the bizarre death of a woman who leapt from a building in flames finds herself mixed up in a cult of witches who are making her part of their sacrificial ceremony during Christmas. Four and five pretty much abandoned the whole, you know, Billy and Ricky thing and just started doing weird shit at Christmas. Yeah, this is when they were like, the, the next year was just sequel and name only. Um, I do see better reception to this one in the third film, but not by a long shot. I hear essentially like it's like an it's fine type of thing. Like, it's all right. That's what I get from a lot of people. Finally, there's 1991's Silent Night, Deadly Night 5, The Toy Maker. An elderly toy maker and his son make killer toys designed to kill the children. Uh, Mickey Rooney appears in this one which is interesting because he condemned the first film as being trash and garbage and worthless. And then he pops up in part five. <laughs> it's fine. And it's fine too, because that's one of the bonus features on the, um, the Blu-ray for part one is um, Mickey Rooney trashing the film. Like they had a collection of like celebrity stuff that trashed the film and he's on it. And so you get to see him like just totally fucking show this film and how, like how dare they make this type of film. He was such an angry, grouchy little man. Uh, you ever heard his? Uh, I was watching. I was reading an article of the worst, or maybe it was the weirdest um, commentaries ever made. And Mickey Rooney did commentary for a Twilight Zone episode he appeared in, and th- he did this in like the '90s. And he clearly didn't give a fuck about the episode, about doing this, because the whole time, like, there's another guy asking him questions about it. And the whole time, Mickey Rooney's like, I don't remember. I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? Like the whole time. It never, pro- never like elaborates. There's no, the guy, the other guy just keeps getting like, all right. Like, you can tell he's just getting exasperated. And eventually like, he's like, why aren't you like, don't you want to talk about this? He's like, not really. I'm here for the money. Like, why don't you just let us watch the damn thing? Like he starts going on a tirade. It's the weirdest shit. So, yeah, Mickey Rooney not, didn't come across as the nicest guy. He, I think he was a pretty bitter old man. Yeah. Uh, the film was remade in 2012, this time just called Silent Night. The film stars Malcolm McDowell, Jamie King, Donald Logue, Ellen Wong, and Brendan Fair. It's a fairly loose remake. Well, I've seen this. Um, and yeah, it's a loose. Um, they even watching the first one, I can't remember too much of what they took to like pay owed, you know, homage to it. It's not bad. It's okay. Like it, it, it had, it's, it definitely retains the sleazy trashy elements of the first film. Like it was a whole thing where like the mayor's daughter, like is sneaking off to go shoot like a porno in like a motel in town and like all this other kind of shit that goes on. Like again, like it really handles from the sleazy vibe. Um, there are some cool deaths. Uh, there's a chick that goes into her, that gets fed into a wood chipper. That's pretty gnarly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, it's it's fine. It's okay. Oh, uh, Michael Mandela is like his, his role is weird. It's very strange in the movie. Well, maybe I'll watch it. Uh, we're running out of Christmas themed movies for this podcast. Maybe we'll just load up on Silent Night next week. I mean, next year. Uh, there is apparently another remake in development for a late 2022 release. So maybe we'll be checking that out on the sneak preview next year. Yeah. And again, I know I mentioned earlier, it's being um, headed by the, the executive producers of the original film. So I have a lot of hope that this one will not be as loose as Silent Night was, that this will be like their, their attempt to essentially like make a modern, take a, take a modern spin on this on what's now become a very loved film in the community. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, if they can accomplish, you know, the wonders they did with the Black Christmas remake, I'm sure this will work out just fine. I'm going to stab you. Speaking of, why is every killer in a Christmas-themed horror movie named Billy? I don't know. I guess because Billy... I. I know Black Christmas. I know this movie. Christmas Evil, he, there was no Billy. Or it's basically Dalton just, this fancy. is my my lead in to just, I, I think it's the same Billy in uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night, and Black Christmas. I think it's the same killer. That would actually be kind of an interesting thing. You know, there's a book coming out called It's Me, Billy, Black Christmas Revisited. 
Well, they're going to, like, yeah, they're going over, like, the whole, all three films. So, unfortunately, we have to talk about the fucking in name only remake as far as I'm fucking concerned. Um, but, you know, maybe they'll approach that theory in the book. I doubt it, but, you know, maybe they'll approach well, theory in the book. think about, I mean, this, you know, Christmas despising psycho stumbles into a sorority house on Christmas Eve where all these naughty sorority girls are doing things and he's like, I got to handle this. Yeah, and he didn't say punish at any point. So he didn't really say much of anything. No, he made really obscene phone calls that like, I think on my last rewatch of the film actually freaks me out for the first time ever and not really so fucking creepy those phone calls for. Well, maybe he changed his MO. Maybe he was like, let's try something different. I'm I'm going to run with this because I, I like it. Okay. Uh, I give Silent Night, Deadly Night a seven. It's not terrible. And it's pretty tame considering all the controversy. I was expecting like a fucking bloodbath considering everyone was like, how dare you? But this is one of the tamer 80s slashers I've seen. Well, it's it, it wasn't necessarily like controversial for its violence. It's, it was mainly controversial for a killer stance. So, like that's where the, the parents had the issue. It wasn't necessarily its violence. They just saw... Like I said, you know, they play with primary commercial during primetime fucking like football watching, right? People are watching sports and they play the fucking trailer and parents just hone in on Killer Santa before anything else the movie presented. I think like, because yeah, I mean, it's not, there's good, like there's a lot of good kills. I know we didn't mention it, but like the uh, bobsled. Oh yeah, forgot about that. That is fucking gnarly. I mean, he just leaps out and fucking behinds the dude. Which they said how they pulled that off was they actually had the DP, the director of photography, on the sled with a camera, and he went down it, and he had to jump out and actually make sure to swing that axe above him for the shot. Cool. Yeah, that was weird, but the body coming down on the sled with no head was was cool. That was cool shit. Yeah. What's your score? My score, I, I'm gonna give this an eight. I think this is a. It's, I, I really think it does pull off being a fun, sleazy um, Christmas horror film. I, I, I see why this has endured and why people have rallied around it. Um, it is, it's, it's just like, it, it has the violence, it has the it quickly. Our screen queen that you almost fucking forgot about. Oh my bit. God. <laughs> um, it has classic lines and punish and naughty and it like i said it's just i can't say enough it's a lot of fun like there's a lot of really just perfect dark humor place throughout this movie that does work really well yeah i agree uh thanks for listening everybody if you like what we do you can always follow us on the socials facebook instagram twitter filmgasm productions email us at filmgasm at gmail.com if you want to shout us um throw us a uh shout out or a suggestion or anything also, you can hit us up on socials for that. If you want to donate anything, click on support this podcast and uh, throw us whatever green you think we deserve. Could be nothing. That's fine, too. So before we announce next week's episode, uh, we have another announcement. Long time coming. Uh, we are adding a fourth show to the Filmgasm Productions uh, calendar. It's going to be a show that is going to focus on the worst movies ever made. And we are calling it Beyond the Bad. Uh, it'll be hosted by my esteemed colleague, Caleb Leger. Why don't you take it from here? Yeah, so we were coming up with ideals for a new show. Um, especially in, um, there was a, a void, unfortunately, left. So we were like, oh, we got to come, come up with a new show. Um and we came up with this beyond the bad. And the idea is that um, when we when I was when I was coming up with the ideal, the basis for you know bad, I'm doing air quotes here. Um, we're picking movies that like we know are notorious. <laughs> sorry, <coughs> that we know are considered notoriously bad. I'm also to an extent using Rotten Tomatoes as a baseline. Um, now I personally could give two shits less like, what Ron Tomato says about film. Because there's so many films on that they fucking hate that I love. Like, it, So I, I... But just for sake of having some kind of baseline, I'm using that. Exceptions will be made, because if I use it for every fucking thing, then we'd be doing every goddamn Friday the 13th movie, because critics fucking hated that series. 
we're going to be doing, you know, partially uh, Rotten Tomatoes, but also partially just our own common sense and what we consider to be, you know, the worst films of any given franchise. We know what will end up on film guys and we know what will end up on Beyond the Bat. And that's going to be at our discretion for the most part. Yeah. And then with that said, what you should expect from the show um, is, you know, we're going to go kind of like the production, like what went into the making film. Because a lot of times, like, things happen for a film to end up bad. No one, you know, they say it all the time, right? No one goes out, to, sets out to make a bad film. But shit happens along the way to lead to that. So we're going to see what happened. Then we'll give out what we can, what you guys do on Oscar Sunday. We'll give out our version of awards. Uh, and like, and it's literally the same thing. What's actually the same was we get for Oscar Sunday, but flip it to worst. <laughs> yeah. Just, I think the only change is that I added one that, because uh, we can't really do sound or music yeah. like you guys do. Worst so music added, moment? What would that even look like? Yeah. So I had to take that out and change it to something else that I think works really well. You guys will hear it in the first episode, so I don't want to spoil it now. Yeah. Um, and then we'd come up with a silver lining. Um, something that we took, whether it's the, something in the film or maybe what the film did, hint, hint to the premiere episode, um, that we did enjoy about it. So, like, something positive. And then finally, something because we were inspired by the very creative human beings on Letterboxd when it <laughs> comes to the bad films. Um, generally, I'll, I'll be the host. But the idea behind that is that the co-host, which will usually be Connor, but obviously, if we can swing it, you know, with uh, Josh and Austin, by all means, as well, they would look up um, up to a maximum of five. They can do less. It doesn't always have to be five, but that's just the max. Um, letterbox reviews, they don't tell me until we actually are shooting the show. So I will not hear until that segment even pops up. And then they just see if they can make me laugh. I'm going to tell you right now. It probably won't be hard because those guys, I, there are some inventive fucking yeah. reviews on Letterbox. It's almost an art form, in my opinion. Yeah. Reviewing a bad movie is, there's a cathartic, you know, thing to it. Like, you get to finally just be like unloading all of the hate and anger and irritation the movie does to you <coughs> and throw it into this review, whether it be like three paragraphs or one sentence. And the co host. Uh, we'll try to find the the funniest of those reviews. And it is not hard, believe me. Oh, no. Usually it's like on the first page. <laughs> um, but, and with all that said, you know, yes, for the most part, this will be a show we kind of, again, quote, unquote, shit on bad films. But also that's not my only goal. My, my only goal with this is, again, taking some films that are hated by a lot of people that are hate and kind of saying like, eh, it's not that bad. Because again, right, this is subjective. So there's going to be plenty of films I'm going to put on there was I actually, you know, for the second episode, there's a film I put on there that I fucking love. But I know the consensus is people fucking hate it. I love it. I And I, I have such a kick out of watching it that I can't wait to like express what I like about it. So, yes, it is going to be a way for us to kind of like really kind of dig into bad films, but also kind of be like, well, I kind of like this film that people will always mm-hmm. shit on. Hence, beyond the bad. It's us, you know, kind of finding like these films that are critically reviled that fans despise films that have been buried do they deserve it i think you know most of the time some of these the ones we have at least picked for the next few months <laughs> yeah for the most part yes but there are the exception so, and it's nice to kind of dig into the exception and find like what why was this film erased uh so it'll be fun and in regards to genre anything goes there's going to be horror comedy sci-fi drama everything like there's bad movies in every genre so we're going to just kind of diversify and show as as much as we can yeah luckily when we were conceiving it um that was one of my early questions like are we really going to confine it to genre and luckily no so and like because i'm it's my since i'm the host i'm coming up with the schedule you know anyone you know, ask connor and i sent i sent him the first two months of what i have planned and it was i made a point you can ask him of trying to pick different genre stuff. Like I try to put like a comedy and then an action and then like a horror. And like I try to diversify it so that it's not just horror, 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 horror and then like an action randomly. It's like, you no, know, it's all this different stuff that we can watch and get a variety of like films. 
Yeah, it's it's fantastic. We already recorded the first episode a few weeks ago, and we had such a blast. We are we're definitely getting a good vibe off this show. I think you guys who stick with us are really going to enjoy this one. Uh, our first episode will be dropped on Friday, January seventh, and it'll become part of the weekly rotation. So every Friday, you'll get to be on the bat. Uh, for the first episode, we wanted to do something noticeably bad, something that is universally despised something that is also really fun to talk about something cool and we decided to go with 1997's batman and robin like maybe the worst superhero movie of all time depending on who you're talking to (laughs) we dug into that and tried this out format worked so well and going forward this is just going to be a blast yeah it when I was coming up with the first episode, it was really like, okay, let me go ahead. And for the first one, I do want to go big. Like, let me look at just what the films that people fucking hate. And I was like, and call it, I guess, timing because we got the new one coming out. I was like, let's go ahead and do Bound Robin. I was like, we we're both kids when it fucking came out. We, I know we both have a stance on it. And it's just so many people. It's just an infamous movie. I'm like, yeah, this is a good way to start this. <laughs> Yeah. Fantastic. So this will be the fourth show of the Filmgasm family. And uh, yeah, so starting January 1st, you have a Filmgasm every Wednesday, a sneak preview every Monday, an Oscar Sunday every Sunday, and a Beyond the Bad every Friday. And that is it. Go, we, no more shows. <laughs> After that, four is good. Four is fine. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So looking forward to that. Next week, is the last filmgasm of the year. So we wanted to end 2021 with a bang. Take on a, <coughs> like a genuine classic we've been wanting to do for years now. A group of friends take a vacation to a cabin in the woods where a professor has been studying his latest find. When these kids accidentally unleash the demonic spirits of the Necronomicon, all hell breaks loose in the 1981 horror classic, The Evil Dead. The film that spawned one of the most beloved franchises in horror history and started the careers of both Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, a favorite of the whole team. This one is going to be fun. Uh, Tune in next week to hear us gush about one of the greatest horror films ever made, Evil Dead. It's been on the docket since the show started. Never quite got to it. It was always kind of waiting for the right time. And I think this is it. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to talking about it. I mean, that's to me just a franchise that I don't, I like every single installment. I like the three original tri- the three original films. I loved, you know, the 2013 movie. I fucking loved Ash vs. Evil Dead. I cannot wait for the new one that's coming out. I think it's Evil Dead Rise, I believe is the title. Yeah. Um, I can't wait for the fucking video game that's supposed to come out next year. Like, so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Evil Dead, it kicks fast. Like, it just kicks fucking ass. Yeah, it's a straight up masterpiece. And it'll be good to end the yeah. Evil Dead Fox. Evil Dead Fox. That's right. And it's gonna be good to end the year on a high on a high note. Uh 2021's been interesting, especially for the show. So we'll talk a little bit about that and what we got planned for the future. But for the most part, it's gonna be just evil dead all the way. Uh don't miss the master on Oscar Sunday and a host of potential greats on Monday sneak preview, including the Matrix Resurrections and the King's Man, among others. Until then, have a delightful Christmas. Hopefully a psycho Santa doesn't murder your parents and ruin your life. Stay cozy and keep watching movies. 